I'm going to have the same. Can I have a side salad with that as well? Would you like a Caesar or a house? Um, Caesar, please. All right, thank you guys. Are they local greens? <laughs> I don't believe so, but they do come from our own um, farms. Oh. We have a farm up in Chesterfield and Oh, okay. Excellent. Well, at least they know. At least there's a provenance I, to it. I think yeah. that every restaurant needs to have an understanding of where their ingredients are coming from. I think that, so. That needs to be something that society starts to demand. Yeah. Says the foodie. It's absolutely true. <laughs> grow a cherry tomato but now I have to grow several because I like the black one and I like the gold one I like the yellow one I like the pear shape I like the little currant mm -hmm. shape and I like them all together yeah they're so nice what do you do with all of them um, put them in salads all the time I eat quite a lot of them in the garden yep yeah. <laughs> and you can make um, they're really great in cocktails hmm really well, yeah. Yeah. What, what's your favorite cocktail to make with a cherry tomato um, well you can just put them in uh, put them in a vodka drink Mm. Um, you know, they're good in Bloody Marys. You can use them like a garnish. Um, my favorite summer cocktail is a peach old fashioned, mm. which is really good with a bit of thyme. That's mm. really oh nice. My. That's really nice. That sounds fabulous. But um, Do you grow peaches? No, we don't. We buy peaches. And I feel upset because organic peaches are an impossibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nobody, you just can't. You can't, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really feel committed to organic everything. Mm -hmm. But when peach season comes, I say, okay, I'll just make an exception. <laughs> I wonder if that might be created eventually by some clever GMO. That would be interesting. I think so. Because I, whenever people go anti-GMO on me, I go, look, oh, if I were to insert you. the resistance gene mm -hmm. for the fungus that killed the American chestnut, Yep. We would have it again. We could have organic. Why, why, what what is wrong with that? The discussion has got to get away from the genetic modification and focused onto the chemistry culture that commercial agriculture embraces. The only thing that people are upset about with corn and soy and the way that American farmers actually farm is their use of glyphosate. Yep. It's not about the gene manipulation. It's about the well, chemistries that they use. No, there's so many people who just GMO is... Well, that's ignorant because know, everything is a genetic is modification. There. And that's frankly why that argument will never hold up and we will never be able to have a rational discussion about this. It doesn't matter. They believe it. <sighs> yeah. I have a theory that Monsanto is actually the entity that coined that term so that scientifically the argument will never hold up in court. Um, I know I sound really cynical, hmm. but... There is a serious problem with our food supply, and it's only going to be increased as the population gets larger. And if we're not having a rational discussion about why our food isn't safe, and we keep focusing on innate details about genetic modifications, we're never going to have a safe food supply. Thanks, sir. Well, I've gotten really into growing my own carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, yes, that's a huge priority, and it's the Thing that nobody in the edible plants movement is really discussing. Are you growing wheat and rye? Wheat and rye and quinoa and rice. Oh, really? Sorghum is my sugar source. Oh, so cool. Can I come visit you? Yes, please. I'd really like to grow. Please. When you mentioned when you mentioned tomatoes, I grow 150 different varieties of tomatoes every year. Really? I throw a, a fundraiser oh gosh, for the Ralston great. Arboretum, all about tomatoes. Didn't you get? But didn't that? Didn't Thank somebody you. cover the story for that last year? Yeah, Helen. Helen wrote about that for, for was country, it for country, country, country gardens. gardens. It was for James. Gardens. Yeah, Marty does a lot of writing. Yeah, for and actually, she's writing a story on. The Crazy Grain Lady this year. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> this year I have 12 ancient varieties of wheat in my garden, taking about 6,000 square feet of landscape bed space. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to see how different they are, all from one another. And, mm -hmm. um, Last year I grew. So how do you how do you come by all this space? Where how much how much? Do you well, live? I we how have much a, land do you have? We have an acre in the suburbs of Raleigh. Oh, that's nothing. It's not. I can't believe you're doing all that. And half of this that's is actually in a tub. woodland swamp, and then the other half is split between traditional landscape beds and turf. And so we're technically gardening on a quarter acre. Mm -hmm. But I use the grains as a living mulch right. essentially between my woody ornamental collection, mm -hmm. which is. 
vast and obsessive because I was a propagator for all these years and about okay. free plants. Right. <laughs> but the grains to me are what everybody needs to be thinking about because mm -hmm. whether you consume carbs in their form or mm -hmm. you eat meat, you are consuming carbohydrates. Wow, that's great. And they are one of the least ethically grown plants in our diet. And it's really disturbing. Mm -hmm. The more you learn, the more you hate commercial agriculture. And I don't want to hate the, my farmers, but I want them to think that they also are human beings and we are all sensitive to chemical issues that 20 years from now we will discover glyphosate is not great for our bodies. Well, Why do we have to keep waiting until we have a disaster on our hands before we decide, no, maybe we should really focus our energy on making organic growing profitable. Mm -hmm. well, we like to talk about sustainable on this level of the environment, but also I recently visited uh, White Oak Pastures down in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. Scott was a big industrial cattle producer and he was loading his cattle on these trucks to be driven out to the Midwest to be fattened up on corn and slaughtered. And he hated it. He said, I felt like I was raising a princess and sending her to the whorehouse. He raised them mm -hmm. on pasture and moved them up to corn. Oh. They were raised traditionally like the University of Georgia oh. would tell you to do, and then sent to Kansas where, mm -hmm. you know, the slaughters, where everything goes on, they get fattened up and finished. They right. call it in the paddocks and then slaughtered. So he actually got Temple Grande to come down and build his own slaughterhouses. The thing I think was so interesting, and not only are his animals happy until seconds before the first time their feet ever touch concrete and they are killed then, mercifully of course, but he also has now created 200 jobs. Mm -hmm. So instead of being this one guy at the top who's raking in as much income as he could possibly max out, now he has... He's helping his community. And that is a type of economic sustainability that nobody's talking about when we start talking about growing local and doing things like that. You know, it's not fun to think about being slaughtered, but um, it's, it's so important to know where your food, where your food comes from and, this guy, and to respect the people who produce it. Yes. yes. His name is Will Harris and he sounds, he makes me sound like a Yankee. He has the <laughs> thickest <laughs> South Georgian accent. He's like, he, he said, I sound like Foghorn Leghorn. Do you remember the cartoons? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, but he, to hear him come out with all this stuff, it really brought tears to my eyes. Wow. He, he loves it. He's passionate about mm -hmm. it. Well, it's exciting when people can use horticulture, agriculture, in a way to sustain community. You've heard of a weed is a plant whose virtues have yet to be discovered. Ralph Waldo Emerson. A weed is a plant whose virtues have been forgotten. Yes. So that's something I think we should also consider. How many, and we're talking about how much money is spent killing these useful edible weeds. Think about the man hours, the spray. Yeah, the misappropriation of resources. Yeah, why general. aren't we doing that? It no, just because makes we just simply are ignorant no of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Um. How did we evolve so quickly? Like the chemistry culture <laughs> is at the root of people like becoming brain dead about consumption. Like at, what, World War II changed everything and this, we just went into autopilot? This sounds like a conspiracy theorist, I realize, but... Um, <laughs> I always sound like that. Yeah, so. <laughs> they, they, they taught us that these weeds were bad because they wanted to sell us something and mm -hmm. we eventually bought into it. I don't think there's any conspiracy about it. I think there's actually probably a lot of fact to that, that I mean, weeds have, I mean, the, the very definition of what a weed is mm -hmm. in semantic awareness is that it's something unwanted. Mm -hmm. And so anything that can be done to remove something unwanted from our gardens or our lives and things is something that people got rid of. I mean, they sprayed it, they, we found ways to do it and we created an industry about it. Well, we all have something in our gardens that we wish weren't there. Sure, of course. <laughs> My but, turf. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but it I do think- into Everything. But there is there's, there's something really kind of deep in, in the culture about grass, about about a, a pure lawn. Wait, we didn't have our natives discussion yet. Oh. All right, somebody plant that. <laughs> we can talk about John Clayton. We can talk about John Clayton, which is a fabulous little little yellow form of Lanicera. Um, do you grow Lanicera flava, the actual native yellow honeysuckle? Nope. This is just a yellow form of Sempervirens, of course, mm -hmm. but um, isn't that lovely? Mm -hmm. I just love this thing. I have it's a so gorgeous amazing. photo of this that I, I took when I was an intern From at... AHS? at uh, well, I have that photo. I have a photo of AHS of it rumbling, r rambling up a, some kind of wicker trellis, but the very first photo I took of this, I was an intern at um, uh, BHG. Oh, um, is that right? And, uh, in the test guard. Uh, well, no, no, I was editorial intern uh, in 2007. I was with the group, the Special oh, oh. Interest Media Group, and okay. James and all those guys. And so. Um, 
Well, I knew that, but where'd you take the picture? Well, I took the photo. One location. Yeah, I took the photo at uh, the Jimmerson's place, um, Doug and Karen's farm. That was mm -hmm. that used to be the original. Really, was the original yeah. BHC test, test garden. Yeah, that's right. Throw all the way out the country, at their private residence, and that was. And they still maintain this fabulous garden, and they had a. They had a great specimen of John Clayton rambling along a fence, along with Clematis Fiorin and Betty Corning. Oh, which is amazing. The combination of those two is so, I mean, just so romantically classic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, there's just something kind of just, and it's not even old fashioned, it's just timeless. I mean, it it's is. just classic about it. And uh, it was on a really, really dewy, foggy morning. And I mean, all of the photos had this sort of gauzy, otherworldly mm. sort of nature to it. I mean, the shoot that morning was great. And I was running around with another camera just goofing off, and that's how I got <laughs> Well, one story. thing I like about natives in, in my landscape is that they are, you know, they're the first ones to react to the change of the weather, like the sassafras trees. I just, I really love the way the sassafras emerge from the margins of the forest in the yeah. early spring before the dogwoods, and you get these little yellow mm -hmm. bursts, yeah. so fine. Yeah. And the native azaleas, and then and there are all the little native ground covers and everything. They're just I call them emblems of the seasons. I mean, they really are these sort of pace setters. I mean, they, they kind of keep the tempo of the landscape. There's no the demand for them. Yeah. I think, Bree, you would say, you know, you know, and people say, oh, sassafras, what a pain in the neck. You know, they can't, they, they're just, they're hard to grow and they won't well, so yeah, from a nursery production standpoint, they, they, yeah, they're difficult. And mm -hmm. I dig them up and give them to people all the time. They do fine. Hmm. Mm. But small. But small. Not, right. Right. Not landscape specimens. You know, I, when, I, when people get on their natives bandwagon, and I don't think there's anything wrong with including natives. But Your my, argument shouldn't be about where a plant comes it, from. Precisely. It, it's, for me, the function is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. And I want to... Carol said all, I want pl to all plants reduce matter. My foot pl that was Breeze. Oh, that was Breeze thing. All still, plants matter. I was all repeating plants matter. Breeze. I give her credit. Okay. But I fundamentally don't want everything I consume to be traveling 1,500 miles. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you want to really help the natives in this world mm -hmm. grow something at least that you consume. Yeah. and change the commercial agriculture model. If everybody in this country grew 25% of what they eat, there would be a change, a significant change, in how food is grown and where it's if grown. If half of anybody in that, I mean, if a third, I mean, a fraction of a percentage of people in this country did that, they mm -hmm. would be in straight. I'm and wondering what you have to grow to grow 25%. Can you do it with vegetables and alone? Um, well, if you're following your USDA could. prescribed diet <laughs> guidelines, yes. You can. I mean, it, it, I think uh, my dream is to see this evolve and not make it so that individual homeowners grow it, but that this is something that landscape professionals offer as a service. The community, then, the community garden model doesn't precisely. become so open source that it really becomes professionally rendered as, Professional. a, service to, as a service to community. And then that food is also not provided as a raw source that people are bewildered by, but it becomes something that chefs take okay. and then is then provided like either the through grocery stores or through restaurants. Well, CSAs like a, have a big role in that. Exactly. Right. Well, exactly. it's even like, it's like a grocery garden center model. Yes. It's like, it's like going to a place where you can literally buy produce that you can literally interact with people who, I mean, it's like, it's like taking a farmer's market off of one day a week and turn it into a seven day a week Into a seven day week. Yeah. And using the resources that the American suburban landscape already offers, right. which is well, not being tapped into and right, right And now. let's take that model. We keep saying we have to feed the world. Well, let's take this local model and, and Apply it to the, the world. The other, yeah, exactly. Exactly. We've, well, what really spoke, to, and we were talking about this last night over over a, a adult beverage, um, was <laughs> the, or three, um, was <laughs> we did the, not have three. Don't you say the, that? Was the idea, <laughs> it's completely believable though that we would have had three before we got to this. No, but, I'm tame. I turned 37. <laughs> Come on, I can't do that. Well, but I mean, we were talking about you know the the sort of the the melding of. You know, I'm so passionate about about thinking about a more ecologically conscious, sustainable approach to how we make landscapes that are emotional, that are romantic, that are that are ornamental, that connect to people's awareness, that aren't just you know, you know, hedges or lawn that you just walk over because people don't see it and they don't care. I mean, that's and, but we were talking about how we sort of meld the two of those in public space, about how we bring about public usable land into a functional sustainable paradigm but then also in a way that incorporates you know edible plants and we I, I, we sort of hatched onto this idea about you know you know imagine let's take a planting like the highline 
or yeah, the, I was gonna say, the Lurie Garden or something. Are, are you waiting for Pete Oldoff to uh, well, incorporate edible plants? Well, I'm I, waiting for them to hire me to get grains into the new extension well, of the house. That's, that's what we were talking about. You know, that's what we're come saying, on, what do we really get from sedges? That was, <laughs> we get a lot of ecosystem <laughs> services from sedges. No, yeah, don't yeah, sedges. yeah. We get a lot of ecosystem services from sedges, <laughs> and, and they're they're undervalued. But, we, but the point stands, though, that to integrate edibles into that space would be a hugely progressive thing. I mean, we were talking about well, using... It's a using motivator for organic management. And not, not just ornamental edibles, but things you're harvesting. Well, yeah. I mean, thinking about, I mean, think about using, think about all the grains that she's growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of those are exquisitely ornamental in their own right. So beautiful. I mean, they're fabulous. I'll never grow another penicetum because rice completely takes oh, yeah. its rice place. Rice is fabulous. Oh, is that right? Cool. And it holds up when we get 15 inches of I rain I mean, so just September. imagine a planting like the High Line that had maybe a 10% seasonal component that was actually a grain project. I'm interested I mean, in that. That actually took grains and used them in an or And actually, they would, once once applied, even though it's a seasonal concept, it would be, it, it would promulgate itself. I mean, I mean, these things, grains recede. I mean, they're, Absolutely. so long as you maintain a certain rural ecology to the, the planting so that those grains could persist through a receding Who annual are we cycle. Who going to pitch that to? You know, the Heartland Harvest Garden should do it. I'm going to do it. You're going to do it. Good. We're going to do it. Somewhere, somewhere. We're going to do it. I want to do it in a whole neighborhood. I got 25 pounds of ground flour from 850 square feet in my front yard that has ornamental trees scattered through I'm really it. interested in that because I tried to look that up last year. We ordered rye grains because my husband likes to make Danish rye bread. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And we had a hard time finding real rye, you know, un cracked grains because we knew just how we wanted to crack it. We were going to do it ourselves. So I tried to look up how much rye do you have to grow? Can I grow this in my raised garden, you know, four by four? Can I grow a crop of rye? No, everybody said, no, you can't do it. That's You're just telling not me true. that's bullshit. That's right. absolute <laughs> nonsense. That was the big thing I learned last year. Modern grains are bred for mechanization. And if you're growing right. wheat in your home garden, you fundamentally do not have the mechanization to get the seed that's out, right. of, out of the chafe. That's right. So what do you do? And I turn to the ancient varieties. And this trial is going to be great because... Mm. How many varieties the, are you trialing? I did 12. It was wow. everything I get my hands on. Wow. And, um, Sources, Baker Creek. Yeah, where did you find them? Well, Baker Creek Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, yep. USDA, yep. was extremely yep. helpful. Yep. Yep. Same thing in the rice department. Yep. Um, but we had a very warm December. Some of the grains were actively growing and then got deeply frosted in yeah. January and didn't come back. Yeah. Hmm. And some are now starting to bolt and are are taller than me. Wow. And I can and are see, beautiful. oh my God, it, oh, there's nothing more beautiful than wheat. I think so. Period. Mm -hmm. no, no. I can say that nearly every neighbor in my neighborhood came last year and took their Mother's Day pictures in front of my wheat. Do you mm. grow oats too? Oh gosh, yeah. Oats, and are, oats are so amazing. so pretty. And actually they're really good grown in clumps like an ornamental grass. Right. Well, they and don't want to grow. And, I mean, that's how they, that's that's how they how grow. They I grow. mean, that's their ecology. I, mean, I, will, I, I will send you all my resources. And, uh, you know, yeah, everybody thinks that it's just crazy. But this is the food crop that matters the most. It's not about tomatoes and peppers. The edibles movement how, so how has wasted you make 30, 25 30 pounds. years, frankly. 25 pounds yes. of flour from 850 square feet. And, you know, oh, I eat a cheese quesadilla every day. I was able to make my own quesadillas from... Flour and salt and water. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> I do. <laughs> no, Bree admits she doesn't sleep. It's funny that making this stuff from my raw ingredients in a zero kilometer model is less time than going to the grocery store. Really? Thank you. You've actually tracked it down. Oh gosh, yeah. Because you know, I'm I'm super type A. I keep track of everything. I had no idea. Oh, I, I, that is so news to me. Yes. I, had, I I don't know what would we ever you, make you think we that. We thought you were laid back. <laughs> I just have that persona. And we love her just the same. <laughs> it's a big disguise. Yeah, right. It's all yeah. The, the laissez-faire Southern girl is just. What, what happened? And really, Sinensis is the plant that needs to have a, a reintroduction to people in, in its use in the landscape. Even if you're not making it for tea, it's one of the most important pollinators for honeybees in the dog days of summer. When the summer stuff is fading oh, is right? and the fall stuff isn't blooming, Camellia Sinensis is there with 10,000 flowers yeah. and a ton of pollen and nectar. Yeah. I'm actually kind of wondering <laughs> what the Sinensis flowers are like. because They're single white, very small, with a ton of stamens. Mm -hmm. Like and these single early peonies that yes. I'm admiring so much in my garden. Yes. I love 
for single panning. Yeah. Love single panning. Mm -hmm. Single just, flowers need to have like a romantic comedy. They do actually. No, because <laughs> they romantic they, comedy. They're early, they don't fall apart, right. they're beautiful, they Yes. They satisfy your soul. Mm -hmm. There's something to wake up and walk out and say, is it opening today? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's opening today. I know. I mean, I, and a I, lot of those big double peonies, to me, they, they're so floppy. Oh, I always I feel like somebody threw a grenade and they're like, oh. I mean, the, the phrase bombshell is both kind of figurative and literal yeah. in some yeah. ways. Yeah. They're awful things. Well, and of course, peonies just aren't something that is scattered through the North Carolina landscape. We don't have yeah, right. the cold You're not cold enough, yeah. yeah. Right. I felt bad about that when Doug Tallamy told me I couldn't grow peonies in boxwoods, but I still do. Aww. I don't think that any person in this industry should ever say that you can't grow something. Mm -mm. I think that can be up to the individual. And that's probably why I have such a chip on my shoulder about the native plants movement. Really, and, They're too and polarizing. Here's, uh, here's something I was thinking about because we were talking about the food. Think about it. These Europeans were coming over here. They're going to establish a new colony. What are you going to bring? You gotta bring your food. You're right. You bring your plants. When flower shows and, don't matter. And yeah, and even it, it just your food. You bring your culture. You bring the things that are beautiful to you, the scent, the flavor. So so sorry that we were an animal species trying to survive. Mm -hmm. That we brought over the things that we. If we were going to go to Mars tomorrow, we, we would, would pack up food. our plants, and we would take them with us, and then. Uh, thousands of years from now, they'd be cursing us for invading <laughs> All Mars. All that wheat. The, Why were people eating carbohydrates? Well, do, do you know that... <laughs> the <laughs> macaroni and cheese plant. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> oh, don't you wish that was. <laughs> and I, I said this at lunch. I mean, one of the principal... I mean, you talk about invasives and things that plants that have... Non-native plants that have become invasive. I don't like the word invasives because mm -hmm. I think, again, that is an emotional term. Yes. There are non-natives that exhibit invasive potential in and other environments. And there are native plants that are quite Absolutely. invasive, Very like that, Cersus canadensis. Yeah. I was reading a piece about some somebody who went to Iceland in the spring and landed in Reykjavik and saw tremendous fields of lupins and commented to the locals and whoever picked him up about how gorgeous that was and they just scorned him because lupins are actually mm -hmm. incredibly mm -hmm. invasive. I mean, here's something that the four of us would travel in a heartbeat to Austin, <laughs> Texas to, to go, go like traipse through <laughs> Lady Bird Johnson yeah. and like have our photos taken and yes. photograph the lupins and the castilias and talk about, oh my God, these are the coolest native plants ever and look at all these bees out here and we would be like swimming in their advantageousness in that mm -hmm. environment and yet the very same <laughs> plant, uh, you know, is, is cursed you know, 5,000 miles from its native range because it, it's, it, it disrupts stasis mm -hmm. and creates a invasive and potential. And oh dear, things will change. <sighs> like the world is going to stay the same. Well, and that's, like, you know, like we're, we're gonna, we, we're, we have somehow created some situation where we're going to make things we're, permanent. Well, and, and the, as, I said, freeze it, time. as yeah. I said, we're going to freeze time. time. As I said at lunch, as, as Emma Maris <laughs> points out in, in the fabulous mm -hmm. book, Rambunctious Garden, have you read that? No, I have not. It's wonderful. I'm Rambunctious Garden yeah, by yeah. Emma Maris. As she points out almost in the first page of the introduction, look, we are guilty conservationists. I mean, the present day field of ecology and conservation biology is based on an artificial baseline that we apply to ourselves, which is that the world was pristine and wonderful and fabulous prior to human domination. I mean, that, that's the baseline that's established. And when you establish that baseline, it makes everything that we do in some context a, a, negative, a negative issue. And, and her point is, is that that is completely arbitrary. I mean, while we may be the most successful mammalian species in the history of the planet, th there was no pristine world prior to the human success on this planet. There I mean, was there, always there was, trouble. There was mm -hmm. still disruption in the system. There I'm was sure still, the dinosaurs. There yes. was still, yes. yeah. so just ask the dinosaurs. I mean, you know, there were, I mean, I mean we talk about deer brows. What about brontosaurus brows? I mean, <laughs> yeah. seriously. Yeah. I mean, Don't you know. we all? Like want to shake hands with a deer when you compare it to a monster. I mean, yeah. it's like you know, at some point. I mean, I it seems know. sort of absurd. I'm not I mean, it's feeling that generous. It seems sort of absurd and sort of comical, but the reality is, is that our our whole construct about how we approach the world around us is very much as a separatist sort of idea. We don't yeah. see ourselves as part I of the just world. We that. don't see ourselves in the community yeah, right. of, of the community of ecology that's out there too. We see it as oh, we've done harm and we have to fix something, or we see it as it's something we can take from. We're all part of the system, I mean, right. and the solution to a more sustainable planet is considering that first. And here's the, here's the thing they hear, hate to hear me say, the, the nativist, is y'all can fight and argue and try to do all that you want to do, but your point is moot. Mm -hmm. You can't do a damn thing about it. I, I firmly believe, you know, we, we live in a post-wild world. Uh, our idea of trying to restore nature to some pristine condition is is my I mean it's mm -hmm. just it's just uh, it's hopeless I mean it's it's uh, it's not even about hope I mean it's just it's just irrational it, it really actually it's it's irrational I don't mm -hmm. want to inject emotion to this because I just feel very strongly it's irrational 
I think what's more important is to think about the fact about how we can leverage biodiversity in the, the uh, uh, having a conversation less about where plants simply are from. Mm -hmm. do, do, don't just check the, you know, the illegal aliens at the border for their, <laughs> you know, their, their credentials, but to think about how plants are used and to think about what the new American landscape really looks like. And let's to think not about, be Trump. Uh, let's, right, <laughs> like, right. Yes. I mean, let's just think about a way that we can really imagine a landscape that is, a, that, is, that is a landscape of narrative, it has meaning, it is, has purpose, and it, and it serves uh, all trophic levels. It, it serves everything from pollinators to humans. I mean, why is that such a tall order when it's that biodiversity that has supported existence on this planet for millennia? And all those why plants that, exist. Why is that such a tall order to be able to take so, a, a learned perspective mm -hmm. and wield that to our advantage as we imagine? And to sum up Bree's motto, all plants matter. All plants we matter. All plants matter. matter. We could have t-shirts that say all plants matter. matter. Oh, plants matter. 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 Oh, I think we also have a really emotional connection with plants and landscape, and I, I try really hard um, a, as a plant collector not to try to have every single plant. I try to look at the plants around me, the plants that are in my landscape, the yeah. plants I drive past every day. Oh, these are the people who have these really incredible prunus. Oh, you know, this is where I see yeah. the May apples. And I really like... It's selfless. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a greater emotional cause. I like to feel that I'm part of something bigger than just right. me and just what I have in my own garden. But I still, you know, I, I want to have my peonies. I, I must have native plants. I'm dying to grow my own rye. Um, but we're going to get you hooked up on oh, rye. This is going to be know, awesome. But for me, I mean, I really, uh, as a gardener, to me, the bugs, the bees, the butterflies, the snakes, the raccoons, the, even the groundhogs, um, oh. I'm, I'm really trying very hard um, because I, I can't garden without those things. I mean, I really, when I go out and I want to know where the turtles are, and I, to me, that really validates my role um, as a interloper. Yeah. Interloper. Interloper. <laughs> Cheers to that. Cheers to that.